So today I'd like uh, Darlene to talk with you just generally about uh, your understanding of uh, philosophy, uh, how it intersects with your art practice and generally your uh, cultural heritage and how, how you think all those things work together. But I'm also happy to talk about where, it, follow our conversation wherever it goes. So uh, the three things I'm going to ask you about in general is just some general background about what brought you to philosophy, uh, Ashinabe ontology. So I thought this would be an opportunity for many of us uh, to get acquainted with an area of uh, knowledge, practice and philosophical thought that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And then finally think about philosophical practice and how your art practice and philosophical practices come together. How does that sound? Sounds fantastic, Catherine. Nice to Great. see you again. Thank you. So let's just start. What, what brought you to philosophy or what was your path to philosophy? Oh, gee, I've been, I've been asked that question so many times and every time I answer it, it's always different. Um, but I think, <laughs> but I think it's really, um, there is there is a a, um, a crux of of uh, and for me um, it's really the collision um, between different thought systems and uh, um, both on the one in, on the one hand from living in a colonized homeland right and uh, on the other from uh, having an Irish father and uh, Ojibwe and Anishinaabe indigenous that is to say uh, mother and um, <clears throat> and the kinds of uh, dynamics and dis sorry discussions that are happening in that in our home right and uh, and I'm also the youngest of 12 and um, and we we grew up off reserve and um, on a small, small four acre uh, farm. And, uh, but what, while I was um, being the youngest, I was, I stayed home the longest. I didn't go to uh, Western education till I was, I think maybe eight years old. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but, but my experience being there was that uh, my mother and her sisters and my, her, her parents, my grandparents, um, they would, you know, they would regularly would would come over and uh, uh, and they're always speaking in the language in Anishinaabe Mawin. And uh, <clears throat> and so for us, we you know we've always been told that our language is our philosophy. And uh, <clears throat> so there was that always you know and and uh, being uh, because of residential school here in Canada where. Uh, the government took away our children to to assimilate them to so that to to rid us of our uh, cultural knowledge. Uh, many uh, in our generation and, and uh, before us, um, it was well. It was actually illegal for to speak in the language and to to perform ceremonies to um, <clears throat> how to dress in our cultural. Uh, attire and you know and, and it would take them to residential school and cut off their hair <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, my mother was actually one of the few people from my reserve who didn't go to residential school and uh, uh, her mother her grandmother actually uh, she Bajma was her name and uh, that's a, she was a good loud speaker <laughs> but she uh, uh, <clears throat> she would uh, have uh, church meetings. So she was the uh, one room school teacher and she was also a minister. So she would have church and people come to her house and she would minister. And then they would go home and she would pack up her kids and her family and she'd go off deep into the bush and she'd have uh, traditional ceremonies. And uh, so really, so Christianity was, was her beard. It was it was the thing that kept her children at home uh, because they didn't know that she was actually traditional. And uh, <clears throat> so my mother also was raised in that between space. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so she was raised in a time what she defined as um, 
uh, a silent teaching, a time of silent teaching. And, uh, and because, uh, so she went to ceremonies and such, but she, she and normally they would have um, been uh, thoroughly uh, taught all about, you know, what was happening and why and, and all the, all the stories and songs to go with that. Uh, but at that time, they had Indian agents who would um, skulk about the reserve, going to houses, trying to catch people speaking in the language or, or, or performing anything that was cultural. And if they did, they would take their children away, children away and put them in residential school. Uh, and, and children would leave at, sometimes in, like till they're 20 years old, they could take them when they're three, four years old. And, and, and so they wouldn't return until they're adults. Some came back earlier, like 15. Um, but it really broke that connection in that knowledge transmission from generation to generation. And of course, while they were there, there was extreme abuse of all kinds. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so here's was the kind of the circumstances of um, my mother's upbringing and, and, and uh, you know, and, and as we were children, you know, we, we grew up off the reserve, we'd go and play in a ditch or, you know, wherever it was. And She'd be really worried. She'd say, uh, oh, don't be careful. Don't go out near the ditch. Somebody might grab you. <laughs> you know, and I said, yeah, I remember teasing her. She oh, heck, who's going to grab us? <laughs> you know, because there are so I many kids. kids. <laughs> I know, I thought we were just all ragtag, you know, like we grew up. Scopes. We'd have to run a block, but same distance of a city block behind our house where there was a pump, you know, it's a big wooden handle. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, but you know, we didn't, but we were raised under that fear, but we're not entirely knowing it, um, that, that what she was afraid of is that they would take us away to residential school. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but we were raised in that, like, so there was a real fear you know, I remember seeing cars driving a laneway and, you know, like at that time, like we actually had a wooden phone with a crank on it. <laughs> and I'm not that old. <laughs> Sometimes I, I grew up in a place where the technology lagged the more sophisticated parts of the country. So I understand that. So you obviously had these two great teachers in your life, uh, your grandmother and your mother. And so uh, uh, now we have a sense of like the life you were coming from. Uh, can we get a sense of the uh, um, uh, traditional, uh, what we might want to call the philosophical thought that's coming from that your mother and your grandmother's teaching you and that you're now applying. So can you give us an introduction to the basic ideas of what might be called Ashinabe ontology, uh, in particular, the concept of uh, Nindu and your understanding of Nindu wording. And for all our sakes, so we can learn to be uh, better at understanding. And since you've indicated it, it's about understanding the language and speaking the language. Can you help us with our pronunciation and uh, the right words and using them correctly, please? Uh, the M is almost silent. It's Nido. Nido. No, no. Um, <clears throat> although when I say that to you know friends who are blind, they're like, "No, it's not silent when you say it." <laughs> but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I do want to say, so my grand, my mother's grandmother, she was passed away, but that was the knowledge that she gathered and then was passed on to myself and my other my siblings, and uh, and of course then you know my father's Irish had there's this other tension of the racism that we that was that was overwhelming and all around us as i've just indicated and so that was really i wanted to know how how uh, people could come here and commit the kinds of atrocities that they did i wanted to know about this racism and how uh um they you know like this these these um these people who claim to be superior and yet they did such horrible things to us. 
And so I speak with my father about that and, and you know, to understand what the like, uh, Western thought. And so really, well, how did I come to this? I wanted to know uh, what the root of racism was. I wanted to know what the root of that hatred was. And I found, uh, and I, I do believe I found it, and I think it's in that logic system, Western logic system, that's a, 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 a colonial thought system. Um, <clears throat> and so those, that, that was the confluence of those things. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, so when I'm reading, reading theory, reading philosophy, uh, uh, for me, it's so apparent that there's so much uh, that we're often used as the, the, um, the, the, the uh, binary opposite of the intellect, the indigenous, the savage. It's in uh, all these philosophy books there, that it, it, it's constantly coming up that um, the, our way of thinking was uh, um, well despised and uh, misunderstood. Mm -hmm. that knowledge is becoming much more prevalent today. All they, they, they as, as always, don't give us credit for that. They define it under other terms like new materialism, um, <clears throat> post-humanism, those kinds of uh, interrelational uh, philosophies are actually thousands of years old, and they come from here. And uh, <clears throat> so, but it's rare that that's ever defined. So, you know, like, like thinking about that connection between, <laughs> like moving between these, that, that kind of, that notion of a singular author and having um, that, um, well, yeah, as a singular author, having that authority to to make to claim that knowledge as one's own, um, it still is. You know, even though there's a an, um, there's this uh, a discussion that wants to uh, decenter the human through uh, the other than human, which is actually comes from Nadeau, <laughs> is the translation from Nadeau. Um, <clears throat> other than human persons, as Hallowell would have said. Um, but it's that, not, that idea that, that um, everything is alive. We know that absolutely everything is alive. And, uh, <clears throat> and so for us, we understand them to have agency, a personhood. And so we, under, we, uh, we know that we, um, um, we consult and respect them in everything that we do. And often like thinking about Anishinaabe and Moen, uh, it's primarily a, a spoken language. And uh, so in that, of course, there, we have to have two or more persons. And those persons don't necessarily have to be human. <laughs> but, it can, but it's never a soul activity. It's not one where I sit in a dark room. Uh, Darlene, um, you just broke up when you were describing that last thing. Could you just say the very last thing you said again? Well, about it, not being in a dark room on your own, you're in a communication. We're, we're always in community. We're always, it's, it's, everything is about being relational, interrelational. And it's, there's that assumption of reciprocity that goes before all else. And uh, um, <clears throat> so, and I'm again thinking about the, the Nado through this. So what is Nado? <laughs> um, well, I use it quite differently. I'll say uh, it's, it, you might say, I don't like to say this, but <laughs> you might say it's, it's uh, um, I'm taking this um, phenomenological experience of this knowledge and uh, um, re-articulating the relationship of, of an actual, um, there's, uh, we could say, Gujemnido, uh, that's in our dialect. Um, you might know it as um, Manitou or Gitche uh, Manitou. Uh, um, <clears throat> but in our, our dialect is Gujemnido. And what that is, is a uh, uh, great unknown. The great spirit. 
and I, I try to keep away from that term spirit because it because it tends to get collapsed with Christianity. And uh, and 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 so when I asked my mother, what what does that actually mean? You know, like when I you know as a child, I look out when I said, what do they, what do they talk about when they when you guys are all talking about spirits? Like what is it? Like you know, and she's talking with her her sisters and her parents, and she says, look out that window. So I go, now tell me what you see. So I just start lifting everything. And, and she said, there it is. They're spirits. They're all of them. They're all alive. <laughs> you know, so the, the, the trees, the, the road, all, all those things, the earth, it's all alive. It's not just the animals and humans or even just the plants, everything. And uh, <clears throat> so... You know, it's that when I asked her about that word, she said, well, that, you know, it's not, I mean, that's how it's usually translated as spirit, but it actually means it's, um, from, from her interpretation, she said, it's more like, um, a potency, a potential and energy, uh, all, all combined. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, then it becomes something very than, than, uh, that English concept of spirit, okay, the English language concept. And uh, <clears throat> so in thinking about like when I, I was started working with Merleau-Ponty, like he talks about uh, the uh, natural attitude and, and how we're, we are, that's a um, naive engagement with the world one that is like this takes for granted your assumptions without really um interrogating them uh, how we've arrived there and uh <clears throat> but i felt as though one of the problems with that was that it, it seems to be he doesn't take in his into account his own biases and um and his own um those and that naive attitude is really a western way of perceiving the world <laughs> and uh, and if I were to talk about our naive engagement in the world that would be something that was was um, attempted to be eradicated um, through colonialism through assimilation and uh, <clears throat> but yet it was those very things that were the basis of our philosophy um, and, you know, we talk about them together and, and then there's someone who's non-Indigenous and we, oh, do we stop? We just, we just, <laughs> you know, because we were actually put in jail for that. Yeah. We were I put think, in uh -huh. uh, I, I was just observing that I think it's a very important and powerful point that a lot of what's considered or comes from the Western tradition that's framed as sort of the naive starting position and then we build the sophisticated system around it is used exactly as you describe as a way of pointing at things that aren't ourselves and saying that that is uh, in some way differentiates and, and creates the hierarchy. So what if I've understood you correctly, um, you're sort of flipping it and saying like, well, our central ideas are, are built from this direct idea of uh, an idea of like just that everything is a certain way. And then we can think about how they interact, but basically everything, uh, for want of a better word, that is uh has spirit or is potent or has this potential or energy is that, have i understood what you're you're saying in yes. how you described it mm -hmm. and in that uh so in a as uh merle ponty describes that it's that it's actually a distancing of of the actual of being of of being in the world that uh um uh an of the world structure Right. And uh, <clears throat> but I, I would say that that's only from a Western perspective that privileges rational thought over uh, a, um, a an, an embodied being with. 
which I would define as um, a Nado worlding, which is uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm moving between that, that, you know, that assumption on the one hand and that, and the, the very thing that we were incarcerated for. <laughs> And, 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 and also we were, you know, our people were um, defined as schizophrenic and, and, and put into mental institutions for, for these, these philosophies, and which are becoming very prevalent today. Um, <clears throat> as but, you can see, perhaps from movements in feminist philosophy towards an idea of embodiment and relational autonomy and that type of thing. Again, there's a sense in which the Western tradition is presenting something as a new idea when actually there's cultural traditions that have deep understandings of these that we ought, ought to be learning from, do you think? Uh, well, I would just or, say that um, learning, well, I don't, I think, uh, you know, I was taught that, um, uh, you know, like uh, there's traditional knowledge, um, ceremonial knowledge, that does that that only belongs to us and that for us to intermingle that it would bring as much confusion and harm to you as yes. christianity is brought to us <laughs> that's super helpful to to sort of understand how to be respectful but also uh think more carefully about how our own practices are important to us and how different people's practices are important to them so that that's a super helpful description of that um so we have a a, a few more minutes before i'll turn to questions and i can see that there's a, a few starting to to uh end up in the q a section um can we turn to your art practice and think about how um Philosophy is something we do, and whether you're as an artist, do you think how how you think that your art practice connects with your philosophical practice? Well, I think, uh, um, um, Catherine, that you're you know, I, I love your starting point. That is, uh, as that philosophy is something that we do, right? And. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, for me, uh, like even in my early childhood, when I wasn't going to school, it was actually I was supposed to go to go to school, and I was forced at age eight, or or else I was going to be taken away into childcare. But up to that, we did uh, a lot of embodied um, uh, work, my mother and I, and a lot of um, uh, <clears throat> I want to say resonance, <laughs> but that's that would take a bigger explanation. <laughs> but it's almost like a, it's almost like a sensory mapping. Yeah. And and uh, and so from that as well, that I'm I'm interested in working in my own community and with other indigenous communities. I, I know I've, I've I've mapped other indigenous people. Like, oh, do you hey, do you want to come to our community too? So, uh, so it's expanding beyond that. But to be um, to reinvigorate those um, <clears throat> those traditional ways of being to to reactivate them, and um, of of um, being with being with the environment in a um in a way that is not um that is a is a, a quieter and a slower practice um which isn't uh, in demand of mastery uh, <clears throat> and one that's is uh, and and to be in tune with and in, in resonance with um this uh like our like of consciousness that so we did lose you a little bit again there can we um probably the last three to five seconds of what you said okay sorry i said it's actually you know it's it's a resonance with yeah. the environment with the with the world and it's uh it, this uh nado worlding is uh um it's a philosophy of uh, of con consciousness, really, it's a theory of consciousness, and and I use that term quite differently from, um, uh, say, um, Nado, as in uh, Gajem Nado or or uh, 
uh, nado or um, manadoc is uh, the plural, which are like specific entities. Like you might say thunderbirds are specific persons. Um, <clears throat> and so what, what I'm talking about is uh, um, a way of knowing and communing, uh, uh, communicating that may exceed our, our, our typical five senses, you know, you know, there's seven. Is, uh, is this pre precedes us as this consciousness mm -hmm. and that we're, we're only an aspect of that. Our philosophy is one that's very, um, uh, uh, what is the word? On the one hand, we're, 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 we're very much so, uh, individuals in that this is my, my body and no one is allowed to talk. The, all of existence is one body. And so our, our uh, um, philosophies are often um, hold contradiction and paradoxes. Um, <clears throat> huh. so yeah, so so that's uh, super interesting, and I now understand why my uh, beginning with philosophy as a doing really makes sense. Because what you described was uh, like art and philosophy are processes, and it, and it's not about mastery. It's not about the end product. It's about uh, a certain type of being in the world and being and what you're describing as being with does that capture sure uh, that's in part what you're you're describing that's great um so we have a few questions in the q a and i'm i'm hoping to the audience that i represent them with the justice they deserve so um <laughs> I, i'm apologies i'm going to be doing reading um, so we have a question from Alex. It's, as you alluded, the Western tradition sometimes talks about a feminine and a masculine principle. The first is more holistic, spiritual and emotive. The second, more individualistic, material and logical. Is there a similar distinction in Indigenous thought? What does the mas masculine principle look, feel and sound like in uh, Nadu? and other indigenous wisdom. Okay. <clears throat> I may have to, uh, I was trying to find it on chat. And is it on chat? It's on Q&A. We've got the question. So, so there's the Q&A uh, down the bottom. You should, I think you will have access to. Oh, okay. It's not on chat? No, it's not on chat. It's on Q&A. Oh, okay. I see it. I see it. Yeah, um, and and uh, Bill's questions first, but I I wasn't purposefully overlooking it because I don't think it's important. I was just selecting the order because it was in get Alex's question was engaging with the direct content so far. So. Um, <clears throat> well, number one, I'm going to say I'm Ojibwe Anishinaabe. I'm actually Ojibwe Potawatomi, but I, I've been raised as Anishinaabe, or as Ojibwe Anishinaabe, so I don't speak for all Indigenous people. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's you know, quite different, and uh, um, <clears throat> so I'll say that. And but from from my perspective. Um, uh, um, masculine. Well, some have actually identified. Um, uh, well, we have our, our uh, Nanabaju is one of our uh, most sacred teachers. And uh, so you kind of get an idea through Nanabaju how very different these ontologies are. Like, so uh, <clears throat> Nanabaju is always fucking up. 
and uh, so <laughs> it does something wrong and then you know is uh, somehow redeems him, himself it's always is it he's it, defined as a he and um <clears throat> but um he, he is often defined as a as a he but but in in that um creation story we have more than one creation stories um but he, he uh, or, or they are defined as as uh as as lower down and uh and so some interpretate that as uh he was lowered down and uh <clears throat> and but through my discussions with my mother that i don't believe that's the case i think that they they were asexual not uh, but so I, I think of it more as not as a, sp a specific um, male or female, but rather as a, a, a way of being. So um, as a, um, as a Nido being, as in, um, <clears throat> so we can, it's easy to use that term spirit here. <laughs> <laughs> Use it at your convenience. <laughs> at your convenience. It was thrust upon me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, there is. A, um, so, some would say it's a, a man that was lower down. But you know, uh, uh, like actually, from her interpretation, so you'd say Anishinaabe. Uh, so it's it comes from Anishinaabe. Um, 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 we'll say. Um, oh, even when we see where we say hello i don't know anything i introduced myself ah but you to sorry actually mean to go go a couple of additional cause she can do them and we usually you know begin with that so we you know we're, we're not only talking um to humans and we also are talking to other than humans um <clears throat> but um and when we say that we say oh was you was you we're, we're actually referring to nan was you as uh, that way of being, we are acknowledging in each other that good way of being, that respectful way of uh, that re reciprocity. We acknowledging that that exists in you and it exists in all of existence, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, do we have that masculine in in uh, Nido? And um, well, we actually. Uh, because I'm not a fluent speaker. My mother was a fluent speaker. Now she's gone, but um, she's not here. I used to talk to her though. <laughs> but <laughs> um, she tells me a story. She says, um, she's she wants to tell this joke. And she's talking about this dog. And uh, she's getting ready. She's really getting excited telling this story. And everybody, we're all, uh, and this dog, he was doing this. And he was, and then she came over here. And then she did, she did this, and then he was up, and she, you know, my cousin kept breaking in and saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was the dog male or female? Like, <laughs> because it's now a generation that's not uh, um, Anishinaabe fluent speakers. Mm -hmm. So they're moving away from that philosophy. And uh, so, um, so it's important to her to say, well, uh, wait a minute, how come you keep switching? uh genders right and uh, so when we when our people who are fluent speakers they often not do gender switching because we don't have the same kind of gendering mm -hmm. that they do in the west in our language but so she kept interrupting so she kind of ruined the story because <laughs> you know it was a joke and she couldn't get to it and she finally she bursts in she she, she bursts in she says well i just want to know did the dog have balls or not <laughs> 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 so that was the end of the story we all just laugh but but that's you know like thinking about like uh gendering we don't have the same kind of they often say they or them yeah um, but that's i don't think that's the answers your question um <clears throat> but, but, but I, 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 I'm understanding I, it. yeah as but, i'm understanding it it's not a not gendered in that way yeah no, the way that i use it no, that that's great. So um, shall we just, we have quite a number of questions. So how about we start at the top and uh, Bill asks, how accurate is the depiction of an Anishinaabe culture in the novels by William Kent Kruger? I have no idea. No, no. <laughs> sorry, so sorry, we can't, we can't help you there. <laughs> um, 
uh, uh, Carolina has uh, a couple questions or, or two parts of thought here that we'll bring together. What are the bridges that the uh, West needs to, okay. Um, I think I, I apologize, I'll, I'll read this better. Um, so what I think is being asked here is what are the steps that Western people, perhaps more specifically Western philosophers, need to uh, do in order to engage with honest dialogues with philosophers that are outside the Western tradition? And uh, the next part, it seems, of their question is, what are the most crucial points that you have detected that impede us engaging in honest philosophical dialogues? Uh, and there's reference to the Netherlands where indigenous philosophies are not present at all in the philosophy departments. And I think more broadly, so I come from uh, the Anglo-European tradition, English speaking, Australia and the UK. and uh, the only Indigenous philosophy I encountered was the ones I sought out myself and, and the good fortune of crossing paths with you, Darlene. So what, what can Western uh, philosophers who sincerely want to reach out and engage with Indigenous philosophies, what should we do? <laughs> what, can, what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty big ask, but <laughs> well, one of the things though is to um, recognize its difference and that it, ha it has equal validity. Yeah. And so one of the things is that like in, in, in storytelling, on the one hand, you know, like um, to, you might say, oh, somebody is telling you stupid stories, you know, <laughs> but the philosophy is actually in the story and in, and in the being with, in that re relationality. Um, so that's to, to under, to, to be, to um, recognize that there are other ways of being that are valid and important. And uh, <clears throat> there, uh, you know, I would say, I would say even more important much more important than the West. I mean, I think we can, we can, we can all see where rational thought has driven us, right? When we think about our environmental collapse, uh, that is the result of rational thought and individualism. Uh, <clears throat> Good. So, so I have uh, in my previous role, I was working on. Uh, decolonizing the curriculum and and one thing that I encountered so this is in relation to what you've just said is that a lot of us whitey whites were so frightened of doing the wrong thing and I encourage people well it's better to have a go and fuck it up than to not have a go at all so do you think that is a strategy that um we we should engage in in that like just asking questions being curious being open to having ourselves corrected if we get it wrong but in by getting it wrong we will have an opportunity to get it right to understand the differences as you suggest oh i i think absolutely that you have to uh go into that conversation knowing that you're incorrect <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, so that's a that's a great starting point. So we have a question or or a thanks from Richard saying thank you. Do you distinguish between what modernist uh, modern Western culture call philosophy and a religion, and can you say something about your cycle of festivals? So, uh, yeah. Do like. Western philosophy likes to distinguish itself from religion, even though that's a historical turning point. Um, what do you think of, is there a distinction between philosophy and religion? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I'm, uh, as for, 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 I'm gonna speak about Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, and I will say for us, um, there, we don't have a religion. We don't have uh, we don't have a concept of evil in our language. 
our, our people, we don't have sin. Our people, are the, this hell that's defined in the West, you won't find any Nishnabad down there. Because we don't have any sin. We don't, there's no, no evil. Uh, <laughs> ours is a way of being. And that's, you know, that comes from that, that first, that what was lowered down. That's what that Anishinaabe means, is ah, is, is something, you might say, Anishin, that's good. You say, ah, Anishin, that's, whoa, that's something really, like, almost exceedingly out of this world. It's uh, divinely good. Uh, Anishin, and uh, uh, Namasa, he would say, uh, Namasa is actually a rooster. We give that, we give that title to that newcomer that was brought here. That rooster and uh <clears throat> because that rooster doesn't stay in, in bed all day and you know doesn't you know just do whatever they think about themselves they they get up first thing in the morning they go to the highest point and they're looking out they're looking out for trouble and because uh, they're taking care of the community and so that's why it's always the people come first no matter what out of whatever we do the people come before ourselves and uh, so we always put ourselves like what what everything that you do is about what is it for the people yeah. and uh, and that's all people not uh, also other than human people uh and another thing about the rooster you know like rooster just noisy <laughs> gorgeous you know it just stretch around so you know like that teaches us about self-care my people they love themselves despite all of the discrimination and hatred our people, they still love themselves. And uh, so, you know, I talk about that self-care. Uh, <clears throat> but this right. is a Nishinaabe, right? So, so I think in a sense, you've preemptively answered or partially answered Jesse's question, which is how does Ashinaabe philosophy engage with other fields in philosophy, in particular ethics? Does it have an ethical system of the kind that we're used to in the Western tradition? Um, it, it's extremely ethical, um, which is what that Anishinaabe is, is that, that uh, you know, in a, in a, when a white man came here, when they first came here, they described these, the people here as uh, exceptional. They said they were godly, the closest thing they've ever seen to was someone who was godly. Uh, of course, that after they decided they want to take our land, then they turn us into red devils. <laughs> but but upon <laughs> but upon coming here, that's how they defined us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is that that exceptional um, ethicality, the being with, and that others always come first. That doesn't that, but it doesn't negate the fact that you know you don't become a doormat that somebody abuses so that you know you hold those contradictions so so that's very nice speaking of contradictions that we can both be the rooster and the giving for others in the next question is could you speak more about the place of paradoxes and contradictory ideas is this similar to a rejection of absolutes and exclusive categories and in brackets, my sense of paradoxes in colonial methods is that there are problems that haven't been solved yet and need to be unpicked. So, so how, how, what do you think about that? Uh, <clears throat> well, I would say it, it is that there are, um, like we actually, we, you know, aside from gender switching, we have verb switching. So there's past, present. So our conception of time is very different. Not, not to say that we don't live in this world that has been brought to us, well, from England. <laughs> you know, like we are, so we are also amidst that contradiction that we, you know, uh, we have all this knowledge systems that are thrust upon us and are projected onto us in, from um, on all all areas whether we go to school watch tv drive down the street even the fact that you're driving on the right and the left um all those things are are uh, mediated from somewhere else um <clears throat> and uh, and they're about proficiency about being uh, uh about a linear uh, linearity about uh, um um uh, you know time is money <laughs> so so for us you know, it's about hanging out together, having a good time. And when we're having a good time, the work gets done. 
But if we're not having a good time, nobody's going to do any work. <laughs> um, I, I feel that really touches me. I, I'm inclined to say to my students to play with the ideas that, that like, think about playing with the ideas. And I, I appreciate that idea of play. Um, <laughs> so we have some more questions here. Uh, there's an observation from Anne coming from a Roman Catholic perspective. I routinely feel uncomfortable and excluded from secular academic discourse. Do you think there is a resonance in that regard with your respect, with, with regard to your experience and uh, your viewpoint of your experience of academia? <clears throat> Well, uh, it's very different. It's very different because my people and our thought system, we did not go around the globe committing genocide, which is what um, uh, um, colonialism did. And, and, and the church was, uh, was the right hand and often, often paved the way for that to happen. So if we're talking about the institution of uh, religion or Christianity, and is that to say, and I feel uncomfortable as the way I feel, I, I, like we cannot compare those. They're very different. Um, <clears throat> have I, I i i personally felt uncomfortable in academia because it was so vastly different than my own thought system yes absolutely and 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 that's a problem um to do with colonialism and majority of our, my people still cannot walk through that door and for a variety of reasons it took me years to be able to go through those doors as in uh because i knew uh, who I was was not respected there. My thought systems were not respected. My values and uh, all of that, uh, who I am, were, were uh, considered an enemy. And uh, we, were, well, <laughs> we were killed and incarcerated. So, um, and religion and Christianity played a huge part in that. So, uh, I mean, your difference, I don't know, like uh, feeling you're on ease your dis-ease with um academia i mean that's that that might be a different relationship but it's um yeah but it's not the same as as my experience sorry thank you so we're getting towards the end of time so i think we might only have time for one more question so my deep apologies for those questions we're going to miss out on from the q a but dolly can read them and um, and thank you for all participating. So Joanna asks, uh, Indigenous leaders, particularly from your tribe, are some of our strongest protectors of our shared environment. How does your, uh, and in, in inadvertent commas, we're, we're going to use the spirit world word, so spirit-centric worldview inform this work as you see it. And also, uh, Joanne says, thank you for standing up for all living beings. So perhaps more generally, uh, you, you uh, uh, noted how uh, Indigenous practices might help us inform understanding our physical environment and uh, help us move towards a more sustainable way of living in a world that's not functioning in that way right now. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Was that a comment or a question? <laughs> uh, so, so Joanna's question, uh, I, I was more just linking it up with what you said earlier. So my apologies for the confusion. Um, but Joanna's question is, is how does your spirit centric worldview inform uh, the work with regard to protecting our shared environment? Oh, well, I would say that is, it's absolutely in fused in that like I, I, I when I talk about this ontology which is which is interrelational reci uh, reciprocal um, those are uh, I, I talk about just the most fundamental basic um, uh, philosophy that all indigenous people understand and so on the one hand that when I write it's it can be quite dense but I'm trying to make it difficult for the non-indigenous people to uh just to, to just to uh, um 
you know, flyby understanding, whereas, but yet able to continue the dialogue to develop, uh, continue to develop our philosophies because they were, because they were put under erasure. So on the one hand, it's, you know, it, it is an opening to have a dialogue with, with anyone and everyone, but, but it's intended like the, the theoretically dense is to, to slow down the non-indigenous readers so that they have a, a, a different relationship with it as um, <clears throat> as opposed with to um, those those things that I talk about they're they're just fundamental and I would say every indigenous person knows them